this week I wanted to talk to you about designing a simple, lightweight RPC framework. Um, this is going to be very simple, stripped down version, but hopefully by the end of today's class, we will have a, a working client and a server that can issue RPCs one to the other. Okay, so RPC, remote procedure call, right? It's a way for a client uh, to make a function call and have it have it look from the standpoint of code like you're calling a local function, local API, um, where in fact it goes over the network, connects to a server, server does something uh, on behalf of the client and sends back a response. So let's try to build a simple server. Uh, we'll call it calculator. It's going to add numbers for us. So what we need to start with, let's start by defining some basic protocol. And I'm going to strip things like um, like handshakes between client and server, uh, version negotiation and all of that. Uh, I can briefly mention that if, uh, if a server, for example, supported some function calls, let's go F1, F2, F3, it would then send it to the client and then client would look at it and select something that it understands that it can support. So say the client would then select F1 and F2 and then send it back to the server and that'll be the final commit if you would. And then server and client would then agree that, okay, we're going to use only F1 and F2 for this communication today. It's a way to do versioning or just agreeing on, on a subset of a protocol if need be. Okay, so let's define some commands. Again, I'll be skipping over the, um, the handshakes and such. So, create an enum class. Let's call it CND for commands. We're going to use unsigned char as the underlying storage for it. Let's make a command called add. And let's define a structure which will represent this command. So this structure will be created by the client, sent to the server, uh, along with a, with a command that it belongs to. The server will parse it, act upon it, send back a reply. So let's say a structure will be called add. And it will have two fields, x and y. And let's say at reply, we'll have one field just called R for result. So that's our simple protocol definition. One function for now, one structure from client to server, one reply from server to client. So it would be nice, like I mentioned earlier, if the client could just create an instance of some object, maybe give it um, hostname and port, and then start issuing calls on, on this object. So this would normally be generated for you by RPC frameworks like Thrift or gRPC. Um, this would be done by the code generators that come with them here. Purpose of this exercise is that we do it from scratch. So let's define a class. Call it client, and let's actually go back to the protocol. And here, let's define a client interface. So I client here will specify what it is that um, the client object should, should implement to to play nicely with the server. So we will have a method here. We'll return an int as the result. We'll call the method add int x int y to two input parameters. We'll make it a pure virtual since this is only an interface. Back to client. Client will now promise to implement this protocol so it will inherit from it publicly. My client. And it will 
implement that. Let's say, um, let's add virtual keyword here, and we'll add override on the other end. So add x, y, override. So in case we um, we mistype some parameter names or something, and and the same signature of add doesn't exist in the interface, the compiler will will fail compiling this code. So it's a uh, override keyword is a good safety feature to use when when implementing interfaces and overriding virtual functions. Okay, but before we can add anything with this client, we need to construct it, and likely we would like to give it um, a host name and a port where the server listens on. So let's specify host and port. We'll take it from C standard int. As we know ports in TCP IP and we'll be using TCP IP here are 16 bit zero to six five five three five or something like that so let's make sure that our port type is that so here's our client constructor and the client will need a socket so let me look it up real quick here on the side i have the echo server open okay okay all right so let's say the client will have a socket, in this case, um, a client socket. And when we are creating the instance of the client, we will pass to its constructor. Let's see, it takes a host and a port. So host, port. And this socket, object uh, if you see if you remember from my previous uh, previous article that I posted this client socket automatically connects so you just you just tell it uh, where you want to connect on what port and it will part of its constructor establishes the, the connection of it and it looks like it actually took a const char star not a string so let's do the same Star host. Okay, so now that we have a socket, it should already be connected. And then the socket, um, it had the the data arrival listener or, or an event handler or set data handler. And this handler is fired when some data arrives um, onto to the socket that's that's uh, listening for this data. So let's see, the signature of the handler is client socket reference and socket buffer time. All right, so let's add right there in the constructor. And socket, set data handler. We likely should capture this, so our, our own instance, because we'll, we will likely be accessing it. And we will be passed the client socket, which is ourselves, so that we can we can reply to something that's coming in. And socket buffer, let's call it data. So here's our signature of the handler. We'll have, a, have an empty body for now. And I don't know what is up with Xcode and this funny indentation that it's doing. Okay, let's see, I'm not typing client soccer, not soccer. We're not playing soccer today. Soccer. Okay, so this, at, at this point, we should be able to do client C. Let's just work on a loopback today. Not loopback, localhost. Localhost, let's say we're going to use port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Something we know we, we can bind to. And next thing we will do, result, let's just say client, add. We're going to ask it to add 
2 plus 2. Finally, we print the result. Now, of course, nothing's going to happen yet. But at this point, we have a connection. Um, we should have an open connection to the server. All right, so now let's let's go to the server. And here, let's create a server class. Not server socket, although that will come in handy in a second. Server. Server will always bind to, to local host or to all, all interfaces. At least I believe that's how the server socket behaves. And all it really needs is the port number to bind to. So include, uh, let's get uh, CSTD int again. And server will be 16T port. Before we finish this, and socket. So now it's our server socket, and the constructor of the server socket will bind. So it will, it will create a socket, sets of options. So the socket is the, the port number is returned right away to the system to use. Um, it will bind to the specific port that we told it to bind, and then it will put the socket in listening mode. So later on, we may need to, we will have to run the accept in a loop uh, so it can keep accepting incoming connections. And the server also has a, um, but it has accept handler instead of data handler. And this accept handler signature, let's see, takes a server socket, takes the client socket, and hosting. Okay. So some information about who connected to us. Okay, let's see. So on the server side, first we want to create our socket, and all it needs is just the port. Followed by, let's add set. Server, no, I call it M socket. M socket, what do we call it? Set accept handler. Okay. So this is uh, something that will be called when a new connection arrives. And again, let's look at the signature. Okay, this is the signature. So when a new connection arrives, we will get the server socket. It will then create a client socket for us and some host info will be provided to us. So let's just keep it simple for now. We have a server. Okay. So let's now create an instance server as uh, let's bind it to one, two, three, four, five. And now that it's bound and listening, the server, we're just going to add a method here called uh, run. And all this will do in a while loop. Socket accept. And we'll just keep accepting connections uh, until say do we call stop on and stop will tell the socket to close so server an instance of it server dot run okay so at this point we should be able to build the server let's see expect it oh that's right Failed again, all right. Any columns? Important. I don't know exactly why you need one after declaring a class. So we have a server. 
And let's see, where's the execute? I think it's under bin debug. There you go, LRPC server. So it starts. And to show you that it's actually listing, I can now do telnet localhost 12345. And collection closed by foreign host. All right. Localhost, but the server is listening, is it? So let's see what's going on here. Server S. Server should bind. Right, create a socket, binds it on any address. Okay, so that should include um, it should be local host, but if not, let's see. Let's try telnet to the local host name. Or it's value with pro 15, local port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, still not. Ah, server segmented. Interesting. All right, well, we'll figure this out. Let's see what is going on here. Socket handler. I'm looking on the side here at the uh, server code I created earlier. Port, uh, support is not in network byte order. Accept handler should be good. Server socket, client socket. Let's see. Very well. Let's see what happens. Let's see if the server will um, react to the incoming connection. Let's do some real time debugging. See out. Um, host info. Let's just print out. IP address of the host. So let's run this. Right, we don't need to run it uh, on the command line. I can do that right from here. Let's start this. Oh, let's see. Nope, let's start. Let's see if we're listening. This is going way too slow. Are we listening anywhere on? Just want to see if this server is in fact listening on the port that I think it's listening on. All right, run. Let's try to establish a connection, see what happens. There, okay. Accept host info name. Okay, I see. So for some reason, it was unable to resolve the host name. That's why it's segmented. All right, so let's, uh, let's comment this out real quick. Instead, uh, I just pretend localhost connected so we can get past the uh, segmentation fault and continue. So back to server, run. All right. Okay. Well, we connected. That's my local IP. Connection closed by a foreign host. That is right, because this client socket was created here. And then once this handler exited, um, the destructor of the client socket, the client socket representing uh, the collection from a client, went out of scope destroy its constructor called closed. That's why the telnet session didn't last. Okay, so first thing that we should probably do when a um, when a server receives a connection, now that we have the socket in a in a more sophisticated RPC framework, that socket would likely be added to a list of sockets. There could be a pool of threads that would um, listen on multiple sockets, or maybe one thread would pull on multiple sockets and then dispatch the incoming commands on the thread pool. Here, since we're building something simple, 
we will um, we will for every incoming client connecting client we'll just dispatch it on a on a new thread. So let's have a thread. So when a uh, when a new client connects, first thing we'll do we'll create a thread. Uh, let's see the thread needs. Thread will take everything here by value, so it will take. Um, Host info, we'll have a copy of it if we need it. Uh, but the socket is not a copyable object. The socket needs to be moved. So client socket move. We need to move it into uh, into the lambda. And I believe I need utility header to make this work. So here's um okay, here's what's gonna happen when client connection comes in. We're going to create this thread immediately. Detach from it so it can just go off on its own and do its thing. And the first thing we likely need to do. Um, thread, that's right. STD thread. First thing we should do probably create a um, set of Set a data handler on this client socket, right? Because right now, um, this this client socket, even if if it receives some data coming from the client, will will not know how to react to it. So, this client socket, let's see, was it set? No. What do we call it? Set data handler. So socket client socket. Here we go. Moved. Mm -hmm. oh. We didn't see the um, the call listed that I was looking for um, because when you capture by value, right, it, it's caught as a constant value. So we need to mark the lambda mutable, so it um, so it allows us to call. Uh, non-constant members on the objects that we capture by value. Okay, so set data handler. Again, now this is this is um, this is a handler on the server side uh, that we're setting for the socket, telling it, hey, here's what um, here's what's going to happen, how you should react uh, to to incoming um, incoming data from the client. So let's see. And the signature of this handler was client socket. So we will get a reference to ourselves. So let's call it let's call it self here. And socket buffer key. Let's call it data. So we'll we'll receive some data. We'll do something with it. All right. Let's see. Ah, that's good. Lambda requires. But that's right. Right. No parameters to this lambda. Let's see. So now, for every incoming connection, we'll fork off a new thread. And in this thread, um, let's say we will just keep accepting the data that's coming in in, a, in another um, in another loop, but not in a handler. But in the in the thread itself, so client socket a while client socket dot receive. So while we received some data, just keep keep spinning. Okay, so now we have a we have a thread with a client client socket representing where we're connected, uh, and it's going to just sit there and start accepting incoming data. Now on the client side again, we haven't set data handler yet. That's fine. Let's now maybe work on the add method. So let's say we uh, we want to implement this add now. Let's call it uh, protocol add. Protocol reply so we don't have name collisions. So on the client. Let's um, create a command, and we know it's um, 
it's just these two numbers. You just set them right here, right? Since we have x and y, let's put this on a separate line. It's clear. So x y, we're just creating this add command. Uh, we know we know that um, comment ID. We know what the comment ID is, right? Because again, this this would all be this will be generated for us. So this this code would be placed in there, but you would need to send. Uh, the comment ID and let's here uh, cast it to you and date T. So we will we will represent uh, commands as one one unsigned byte. So now that we have that, uh, we can now let's make an instance of a serializer for the client. So serializer so MS. It's coming from from the lightweight serialization framework. That, uh, that I talked about earlier. So let's now serialize. So ms dot pack. So let's pack command id followed by command. Now, in a in a, in a previous uh, previous class, I showed you that to the serializer um, we we can add pack transforms that um, that would Tell the serializer how to pack a, you know, a, a custom data structure. Um, I don't need to do this here uh, because the default behavior is to just do a bit by bit copy, and that's that should be good enough in this case. So um, the command will be packed as, as one byte, and then this structure add will be packed as likely eight, probably eight, depending on a, on a padding. So what we do here in the end, once we serialized all the data, well, now we just got to send it. So socket send data data and whatever the data length is. Or is it size? Yeah, on the vector, it's a size. OK, so this will. This will create the command, serialize it, send it to the server. But now we want to wait for the reply. So something needs to happen in this um, set data handler, right? That um, that would then unblock maybe this function once it um, once it received uh, some sort of a reply from the server. So likely an event would be needed here. But we I have one. Include event, some event classes I created a while ago, um, just using standard components. Um, and this, I'm, I'm going to wire this with that here. Um, normally, um, this add would likely be, there'll be a command context that you would create, put it on, uh, put it on some sort of a container, a list uh, after it was dispatched, and then it would have an associated um, it would have an associated event with it. So, in fact, there would probably need to be more in this structure. There would probably need to be a field here um, called maybe sequence number that the client uh, would then um, generate a sequence number. So let's just say here it's going to be one. Um, it would send this data. And then this sequence number one would be associated in some sort of a mapping uh, with an event. So maybe we can let's see. Maybe we can do just that. Include. Uh, let's see. Just use a map for this. And where would we put? Let's make a map here. Just a map of. Would be a sequence number to um, auto auto event should be fine. M CTX. Let's call it map of, map of context. So once it is, let's uh, let's also do a maybe a static. Oh, it doesn't need to be static. Uh, let's say int m 
sequence sequence number starting with one so that every time we're issuing some sort of command so we're going to do this properly and sequence number we're going to put <coughs> going to put a sequence number inside the command that we're sending packet send it okay so now after we send it we can uh, insert it into the map it's actually this number will be m s n sequence number so let's see how can we add an event into a map auto event i believe takes a boolean whether it's signaled or not that's right so it starts off not signaled okay so let's now map that in place. No. So let's map that. Uh, map of sequence number. Probably have to move the event into it. So auto event. And it's going to be unsignaled by default. That should be fine. Let's see. We are still working. Yeah, we're working on the client. So let's see if this compiles. Map. That's right. It's MCTX. So map of context. Good. Failed. Failed. Lovely. I can only tell you why. Object of type rule. Will be assigned because it's copy assigned the person implicitly deleted. Uh, so it looks like I didn't define a move operator for the event. That's right. Okay. So we will just we know it's going to be initialized. Ah, so let's just take just take a reference to this. This event that's that's in the map under the sequence number, and then we're just going to wait on this event to be seen. So at this point, the server side, this one, it said data handler should fire. So let's see if that's going to, to happen. Let's um, maybe from this buffer. Let's unserialize everything that, uh, that was sent to us. So, auto, um, let's maybe you see for unserialized command. And again, we also need an instance of a serializer here. Yes. Okay, so here on this end, unpack. Now, here we know that. On the client side, when we were packing, right, we packed a sequence number, which was which was an int, um, followed by the x and y. So this structure contained three fields. Uh, so we can just unpack it just like this. P add. So we're just going to tell it, hey, unpack this p add command. Well, we don't really know it's p add. Uh, it, once we would start adding different commands, it could be something else. So maybe at first you would unpack just the command, in which case you wouldn't be sending this as one structure, but you would combine it. You would have a first structure called a header, uh, then following structure would be the, the data associated with a command, and the header would contain the actual sequence number and the command ID uh, that's being sent. Let's see. We didn't even, uh, yeah, I didn't even use a, oh no, I did use a comment ID. Oh, never mind. Okay, so we know that it's going to be U and 8 first on unpacking, all right? So we're going to unpack U and 8. Let's actually go in here real quick and modify the, um, let's call it EE, let's give it this value so we can see it in the debugger more easily. OK, so on the unpacking side, when the data arrives, it's going to just unpack the command first from the buffer. 
and this is going to give us a tuple. So auto command ID, let's extract it um, using std get zero from this UC. So let's break here and see if this is going to, if this is what's going to happen when we run the client. Okay, so server builds still, hopefully, okay. Client, this client is going to hang, but it should at least send this data, pack, pack this command and the associated data. Um, and we should start receiving some of it on the uh, on the server side. Okay, let's build the uh, PC. I don't know why Xcode doesn't sort these. Um, oh, it doesn't sort these alphabetically. Okay, so we built. Uh, let's see. Build the server. Build failed. All right. Why? This coming is captured. Ah, that's right. We're trying to access members of the. Um, of the server class, so we need to we need to capture that as well. Okay, so we have a server compiled. Uh, let's make sure we can compile the client. Okay, back to server. All right, let's run it here. Now let's go to our console. This. Where we have LRPC client. Connect call failed. All right. Why? Server is running. One, two, three, four, five. Client. The host one, two, three, four, five. Hmm. Interesting. Is the server running? Yeah, it is. Right talent. Or did I forget to um, maybe I forgot to change the port number to network order in one and not in the other. Let's see. Server port socket. Okay, and port. That's fine. And then end port is end port transformed in any way. Bind. Okay, H. All right, so port is transformed when it's passed to the socket API. Let's see, what about the client? Okay, same thing. So that should that should all be fine. Mm, so why is the client not not connected? Whatever connect failed. Huh. Let's see, the server should be running. So, tell it local files one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Ah. That's right. I think the client expects actual host name, and not um, not the local host. So, Martin's MacBook Pro 15. That local. This is all running. Okay. Let's build. Let's stop the server for a second. Uh, let's build this client. See if that's going to help. Okay, there we go. Back to server. Right. Here, okay, let's run the server again. <clears throat> I'm going to put a breakpoint in this data handler here. And let's go to the command line on the client. No, not this. And the actual client. Hmm. Still can't connect. In that local. That's right. One, two, three, four, five. And the server is one, two, three, four, five. Except. Hmm. Not quite sure what's going on here. Let's see. 
Ah, oh, these are. These can be painful when you're trying to uh, develop it and debug it at the same time. Okay, so server. So just run. All right. And did I forget to rebuild the client? Did I, did I build it? Just in case. Okay. Uh, server. Okay. One more time. So it's running. Client still can't connect. Tell it can't connect also, but 15 local. Connection refused. Interesting. There's no. Uh, Is it listening on that socket? Uh, one, two. Yeah. It should be. Oh, wait. The server. Um, sorry. Okay. It should the server wasn't running. Socket. It is. But I, I think I forgot um, to let a breakpoint run. Okay. So there. Yeah. It's connecting. Client. Client can't. I don't know what is going on here. Server is still running. Hmm. We all right. So something's up with the client. I'm telling it to the server, the client that its client address is okay, right? This is the host name. So then there. Ah, okay. Let us look at this whole thing. Passing port as a one byte instead of two bytes. So it was getting chopped up. Okay, no wonder it wasn't connecting. So localhost would have probably worked too. I don't think about it. Okay, well. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, let's re rebuild the client. So we can actually see something happen. There. Back to server, hopefully this time. Let's keep this, um, let's put this breakpoint here. Run the server. The client's going to just send this command, all right. Come on, client. There we are. So now we're we broke into the server in the handler for the incoming data. So let's see what we have. UC, which is the um, uh, that's the pack. Let's see, command ID. Okay, slash x e e right. So at least we know we got this byte correctly, and then followed by twelve more bytes, which makes sense because the the command is three ints, four bytes per int. So if we look in this buffer, data, no, we're already, we're already maybe out of scope. Let's uh, start connecting again. Okay, see so another connection came in data there. So we put a sequence number one, right? And then we asked to add two plus two. So this data is being properly packed in a buffer. Okay, good. So let's just unpack um, the whole p add just to make this exercise quicker. Um, but again, normally you would just unpack the header of the command um, from the data that came in. And in similar fashion uh, that the server has a mapping between uh, the command that it sent out and some event that then, um, I mean, the client has this mapping sends out that command and then waits on an event. And when this reply for this um, this specific command comes in, the client would then look in this map, find the event and signal that event uh, to unblock the client. And at the same time, letting him know that, hey, by the way, your, your data just arrived, right? So on the server, now that we, um, that we received it, so let's see. 
auto, so that's going to be the add command. Let's pull it out of the unserialized buffer. Let's see. And maybe let's just print it out. So client says add x and this and, and that y. So let's run the server again and let's see if we were able to pull out this data properly on the server side. So if I run the client again, there we go. Client says add two plus two, right? So now we have to respond to it <clears throat> somehow. And this is um, this is why it's important to have this um, self so that you know you're getting a reference in this handler to the socket that the data arrived on so that you can reply on the same socket, right? So let's say response will be, and let's now create our uh, reply server so our response to this command from the client will be then to take add x plus add y right because that's what the uh, <clears throat> that's what the client wants us to do now in the protocol now we would add another command add reply let's give it e ff and have the server construct a proper reply, just like the client um, had a sequence number. So we can, in fact, we should, in fact, add this sequence number to this reply. Because it's needed, <clears throat> right, because the client is asynchronous. The client sends, sends data on the network and then stops and waits. But nothing stops another thread on the client from <clears throat> issuing the same command again with some other parameters. So when the replies come in, come in um, it's the sequence number that's associated with the event that a particular client thread is waiting on to be unblocked. Uh, so you, so the server needs to send it back, right? It's it's the context of the command. Really. It's it's that which tells the client which which request have I received a reply for. So let's construct it. We will now let's say create a new Excuse me, command ID, or we use the same variable, STE, we're going to pack it as a byte, and this time we'll do command add reply will be the command ID. Um, add reply, let's see, also needs, we added the sequence number, here is the first field, so let's return the sequence number. Add that sequence. Is that what I called it? Okay. SDQ. Yeah. So we're going to say, okay, we're going to respond with a new comment type, add reply, and this is our reply structure. We're adding the sequence number. Again, all these sequence numbers and command types, um, this would this would normally be put in a header. Um, of in, in the protocol, but since we're keeping this protocol so simple, I, I didn't bother to define a header here. Um, but it would it would normally be something like struct header some fields here, and then each each other structure would have would begin with with a header, uh, so that every command in your in your protocol you know. You know for a fact that okay, there, there will be a header always. So I, I know I can always at least parse out this many bytes that came in before I need to look at, at the rest of the payload. And that's why it's useful if you can, you know, to to make it a, a single byte command. If you're gonna have so many commands that you, you need more than one byte, that's fine, um, because you will always receive at least one byte, right? So. And if, if the network connection and the network situation is such that the data is, is arriving 
still in sequence like it's supposed to on TCP, but maybe fragmented. Then at least when you get a command ID, you know, okay, you know that there's going to be more bytes. Um, so you wait for at least the header to come in and then header would usually also have a size associated with it that would tell you in case of variable length commands, um, they would tell you how many bytes are to follow um, because it could be a command instead of adding two integers, it's going to add two strings, right? Or concatenate them together, in which case it, there'll be variable length. So you would need to account for that. Okay, so we have the command ID, we have the reply structure. Let's see, the client serialized it. Let me go like this. So let's do, let's do the same on the server. I was going to pack command ID followed by the command itself. Uh, so let's see, we have a command ID data we cannot assign to because that's a parameter. So let's call it um, RD for reply data. Here, reply command. Reply command. So here we have it packed into a buffer. And finally, uh, self. So on the connection, on the socket that it came in, we're going to send the response. So here we have rd dot data, rd dot size, and that's pretty much it on a server side, as far as um, as far as reply, handling the command and sending the reply goes, I think. But now on the client, we don't have enough. We don't have enough data structures on the client to actually handle it just yet, uh, because we created this map, this, this context map, um, but it only has an event. It doesn't have. There's no way for us to pass the associated data if it if it comes in. So let's instead define something like. Uh, maybe command context structure. And in this case, I'm just going to put add, uh, add reply. Let's see what I call it, p add reply. Oh, that's right, protocol. So reply. And the event will be here. So auto event e. All right, so this structure, this mapping will, should now have enough information uh, for us to, to be able to transmit the response properly to the thread that's blocking on this add call um, once the reply comes in. So here's our data handler, all right? So we know, again, we need to unpack the uh, the, the command that the server sends. So let's see. Let's let's borrow this code here again. And we know that the server would send us um, a command ID at first, right? When we were packing it, a command ID file followed by this p add reply. So let's do p add reply in the uh, in, in the incoming data handler. Again, this we only have one command at play here, or really two, right? So we can only send add and we can only receive add reply. Um, in, in a more sophisticated framework, obviously, there would be another additional layer of, of abstraction of mapping, which would map um, the command ID to some sort of a callback, sort of like this, right? That would, they would then take the rest of the data process it according to what command or what reply for which command came in. And then again, you know, put the data somewhere, um, maybe in something like this, this command context, we could have multiple uh, different command contexts. Uh, there could be a, an interface describing a command context and then derived classes that, that hold various types of data. And maybe, you know, some sort of a virtual call, like a hey, process or unpack yourself or whatever, or you would just give it um, give it part of the data that came in and would, would unpack itself. So, so this unpacking code would actually be hidden um, either, either behind some, some other Lambda 
only responsible for handling that specific reply or could also be a member of this comment context. So when we receive the reply, so add reply, this is what came back from, um, from the server. So let's just print it, see what we get. Let's actually add some more tracing here to the client. So client says, add, let's put here in parentheses, the comment ID, but let's cast it to an int, otherwise it may not print correctly. Okay, so on the server side, we're gonna say, hey, client says, add, I'm gonna print out the comment ID, what, it's, what it wants us to do. And on the client, once we receive the reply, we're going to say server says, let's see here, server, but be consistent. Server says, add reply, or just reply. Again with uh, not comment ID. I think I wanted to print the sequence number. Yes. Okay, and yeah, we know the comment IDs. I want to show the sequence number so that we can trace multiple commands flying. And apply sequence. And result that we got from the server is and uh, reply dot r right. So we are going to print it out here, or maybe let's not print it out here. We'll just say a server says reply, and then when we process it here in the client. Uh, in, the, in the in the comment function, we'll, we'll print it out here. So what do we need to do next? Now that we have, we need the command sequence number, right? So the command sequence number is part of the reply. Here. Now we need to find this associated context in this map, so mctx, for the sequence number. <clears throat> we need to do two things. Reply. We can just assign this structure in this case, right? So we are storing the reply in this map so that when this when this add unblocks after this event is signaled. It will be there ready for us. And finally, mctx sq dot e dot signal. So once we are unblocked, we can then get the reply, reference to reply from mctx of the sequence number dot reply. Getting a reference to it, no need to make a copy, right? And finally, we can say, See out, so it says reply. Here we say that, that, that. result is reply.r. So this is end to end handling of a, of a single command. We, we make a call here. So let's now, oh, where do I go? Let's, let's run a few more comments. Let's do two plus two. Uh, let's say we'll do four plus four. Uh, let's think big. There. So we will issue three consecutive calls to the server. This should create uh, three entries in this context map. 
And of course, once the event is signaled, um, it would likely be the responsibility of this function possibly to then go mctx. And once we got the um, reply, erase, so pull it out of this, um, pull it out of this mapping. So it's not lingering. Uh, you may ask about timeouts and such. Yes, there could be there could be some sort of a watchdog, maybe some sort of a thread that looks at at outstanding pending commands, and if um, if reply hasn't come in in a specific number of seconds or minutes or whatever, um, it would still unblock this call, right? But of course, this reply or this this structure, this context structure would be more sophisticated, would possibly contain a status code or something, so that this function could either uh, return with a result that it got, or if it if it didn't get a result, it would throw an exception, right? So that's all possible. It, it can all be built on top of this uh, this simple skeleton. So let's see. Server. Okay. Let's see if server is going to act like it's supposed to. Let's build server. Let's build client. No client is not happy with something. What is it not happy with? E wait. No member name wait in client command context. Aha, that's right. We'll be getting this. Uh, so this is our CTX we pulled out, so we need to CTX dot e dot wait. There, because before it was just an event in this map. Now we replaced it with this command context structure. Okay, and here here's the client. Oh, all right. Switch back to the server real quick. Come on, server, where are you? No. There. Run the server. Run the client. The client says that. All right. And then it's blocked on something. Interesting. What could the client be blocked? Will we not signal the event properly? So context. Hmm. Yeah, something is keeping the client from uh, from unblocking. So I suspect maybe maybe this event handler. Let's see. We'll be back there. So now back to client. So we think the server is working good. So let's run let's run the server here, the terminal, and let's see what happens when the client doesn't get the data reply. Looks like it never does. Client says add one and two. And this uh, this handler never fires, right? But why? Ah, of course. Why? Uh, because the client isn't pulling on on the on the replies. So the client also somewhere needs to um, keep asking for for the incoming data. So, like we have a while loop in the server. Let's see. What I call this receive. What is it on the socket? On the client socket, there was a. Um, no, that's a server accept on the client socket. There was okay. Let's receive. So let's see. And I'm forking it off on another thread, um, so that this this main thread that's issuing these uh, these calls can can be unblocked. So okay, here's a thread. All it's just going to do is call C that receive. I'm going to detach from. Let's build the client again. 
it is not happy about something again, that's right. And to include thread. Build. No member named receive and client. Aha, that's right. This, this is this is not a socket. The client is not a socket. The client is or start. Right, the client also the client also needs needs this. So let's put it there. The start method, which will just be just be receiving data as it comes in and then firing for each data packet that comes in. Uh, it will be firing this this handler that we set up here, except it's called ns. So the and serializer ah right so okay so okay so here once we connect it to the client let's just say hey start fork it off another thread because this needs, needs to happen somewhere right the usually uh, usually likely i think the, the incoming data processing happens somewhere else um, unless the framework is very simple that the client could send the command and that instead of doing this um, this wait it would just do um, you know socket dot receive would just wait right here but then it wouldn't be wouldn't be very flexible I suppose because then you wouldn't be able to send multiple commands from the same instance of the client to the server because then when the receive came in you know, could get confusing, right? Because you send it with a sequence number two, but uh, but it receives a reply with different sequence number, and then then what? Can't really push the reply back into the socket for somebody else to pick it up and look at it. Let's see. Let's try to build this client again. And let's step through it this time. Okay, server is still running. Client run. All right, so we, we we just hit set data handler. That means we got something back from the server. Let's see what we got. Command ID was 0xff. Okay, like we said, that the reply would be ff. That looks promising. Here's the add reply structure. Mm -hmm. Let's see what is the sequence number. Okay, sequence number is one, which makes sense because here this this was from the previous run this line so this was the current run all right server says yeah i got a reply and now hopefully this unblocking of the event works there we are let's see some things what are those three to seven six sevens? This, uh, I don't know what that is being printed out. And the result. Mm -hmm. Result equals OK. Sounds good. Ah, of course. I'm not returning it. Return. Apply that R. So I don't really need to. Um, I don't need to print it here twice. Let's run it again. So like we wrote in the code, right? Add two plus two, add four plus four, and add thousand plus two thousand. So let's run it again. Client. Here, server received three consecutive commands from a client to add with, with increasing sequence numbers. And these sequence numbers don't have to be unique because they they associate with the socket on a server. So another client we could run two clients at the same time and they could be, they would have their own connections, they would send their own commands with their own sequence numbers, and that would be okay. And here's the replies coming from the server. So server says reply to command 
with sequence number one, two, three, with result four, eight, and three thousand. So that looks good to me. Stop the server there. So this is this is basically what the frameworks would generate for you, except as I said, far more complex um, because there would be there would be more more management, maybe not management, more more state, right? Both the client and the server would have more state. Uh, the server would certainly be designed better as far as handling multiple connections, multiple clients simultaneously. Because right now, it, each um, each accept each new connection coming in just just forks off a new thread, right? And runs on this thread for as long as the client is connected, right? And we we first set the, the handler. Remember this, even though this is a client socket, we are on a server side here. So on the server side, the client socket represents the connection that somebody else made with the server. On a client side, the socket is the connection to the server from, from the view of the client. Um, let's see what else can be said here. Yeah, there would definitely be more state on the server. Mappings right between command IDs and command handlers. Uh, possibly some versioning there as well. Um, cleaner, cleaner separation, right, of the of the incoming data handlers and and where the command is actually handled, right? It would likely not be done in the same call. It would likely be forwarded somewhere to an actual uh, server side add command handler. You know, there'll be a handler for the incoming network command, and then there will be a separate handler for. Uh, for the command itself, once it's been parsed out and its data has been verified that whatever came in is, um, is not corrupted, whatever, or is, is within the ranges that the server expects and so on and so forth. Uh, but the principle overall is has, has been demonstrated here, I believe. Um, and what you would what you would do with a, with a more advanced framework, right, you would define your protocol Usually in form of um, not 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 as a C um, C header file, but in case of protocol buffers or gRPC, the protocol buffer language extended to uh, to handle um, clients and server interfaces. Uh, you would run it through compiler of sorts, and it would spit out a lot of code for you on the client side. Um, pretty much all of this. Would be generated for you because the actual handling on the of the commands needs to happen on the server. So on the client side, you just include a file and and do this. Um, and this this pooling um, of of incoming data would be done would be invisible to you. I'm pretty sure. Uh, maybe it would be initiated when the client is constructed, put on some sort of a thread pool in the background that you're not even aware of. Um, that is if you wanted blocking commands, right? Here, the, the trick here was that we wanted to issue the command and wait on this line. We could, we could as well just register a add reply handler with the client, but then it becomes more complicated to use this client uh, because you, then you're dealing with asynchronous programming. Whereas here, it's simple because it's blocking. It's, it's really no different than just making a local function call. And all the, everything happens behind the scenes. So, like I said, on the client side, everything would be generated for you, except this, minus this line. Uh, on the server side, pretty much all of this would be generated for you as well. Um, you would then include something, some other file, compile against some C files, C++ files, files, um, and then you would be able to create an instance of a server like this and say, okay, off you go and run. Um, and what the implementation you would need to provide would be just the handler for for the actual command, not not so much the handling of the network data, unpacking, parsing the command IDs, validating, but you would you would implement an interface on a server side like I server command handler something, um, and the interface would likely be very very simple. It would be something like I server type let's see um, 
probably. We'll call int add int int right, and somewhere you would implement a you know, command handler, and there could possibly potentially be more of these virtuals here, or maybe each command would have its own interface. I think in the frameworks that I investigated in the past, it was just one uh, one interface that your handler then implemented and provided um, just provide implementations for this without being being to totally unaware that any networking is taking place. Right, so virtual int add int x int y override this would literally be all the code that you need to write and the rest would handle the rest of the generated code would handle grabbing the reply possibly this could return an error code and and the signature could be something like like this It really depends on the framework. I've seen seen them uh, to do it this way. Uh, some do it just to a return statement and use exceptions for for error handling. So, but um, yeah, the principles are are fairly similar. <laughs>